Rule number 10 is going to be follow the moral encyclopedia. For ornery young men and women desperately desiring physical and emotional intimacy, yet having to navigate a dating culture that required them to act a certain way, well, it meant self-help books were all the rage. And women in particular drowned in them, thanks to the fact that these books were often written by hypocritical men and had been used since for medieval time to dictate and instruct women on how to become the perfect submissive little doll. Some examples are Henry Butter's ominously titled Maiden, prepared to become a happy wife and mother from 1868, and Hayden Brown's Advice to Single Women from 1899. Perhaps most famously though on advising the morals of young women was the Moral Encyclopedia by Charles Varl, which had been making young women hate themselves since 1861. It was a bestseller of its day thanks to the marketing that only decent and morally driven women would own it. To prove themselves as that woman, Victorian gals flocked to the bookstores to absorb some menial patriarchal crap that goes as follows. Read no novels, but let your study be history, geography, biography, and other instructive books. Also, trust no female acquaintance, i.e. make no confidant of anyone, because we don't want you ganging up together. Oh, I mean, possibly breaking your feeble tongues, having a conversation. Oh, and if you get a pimple, expect nobody to ever love you again. To quote, remember that whereas the character of a young lady is considered angelic, and blemish in it would withdraw the respect men have for you. Rule number nine is to follow a handbook of etiquette for ladies. Following on a similar sales tactic of gaslighting, only perfect and honorable women know all the rules of etiquette. Oh, you don't? Oh, well, that's such a shame. Now you lose all your honor. You know, though, I can help you out. It's pretty convenient that right here behind me, I have this book I wrote and it has all the rules. I mean, I can give it to you so you can restore your honor if you give me like $30, I don't know. So what's in this immensely popular bestseller from the 1860s that bullies women? Well, I'm so glad you asked. First up, keep that bling to a minimal mamas as you should should never wear mosaic, gold, or paste diamonds. They are representative of a mean ambition to appear what you are not, and most likely what you ought not to wish to be. You got a problem with that? Well, sucks. Pipe down, because it's better to say too little than too much in company. Let your conversation be consistent with your gender and age. Don't forget to never talk about yourself either, as such discussions cannot be interesting to others, and the probability is that the most patient listener is laying the foundation for some tale to make you appear ridiculous. If you do open your mouth and your choice is to be a dirty joke, girl, BFF, because a double entendre is detestable in a woman, especially when perpetrated in the presence of men. No man of taste can respect any woman who's guilty of it. Oh, my personal favorite. Did you break something while a guest in someone else's house? Nah. As a lady, you can't do that. It's not possible. Pretend like nothing ever happened. Don't own up to it and gaslight your host. About another's house, should you break anything, do not appear to notice it. Your hostess, if a lady, would take no notice of the calamity, nor say, as is sometimes done by ill-bred persons, oh, it is of no consequence. Rule number eight is having a dress for all occasions. Should you not, well, that's not proper etiquette. As a middle or upper middle class Victorian woman, your job was to spend your day like a brat's doll, changing every few hours. This is because of the strict etiquette of the time, which dictated that certain dresses were for certain activities, which meant you had to plan your errands around your outfit changes that made it possible for you to run your errands. Isn't that fun? Women would start with the morning time dress, which was relatively comfortable by Victorian standards. However, for us, it would still feel like wearing an iron reinforced tube sock on our entire body. It was simpler in appearance and designed for only the home. Want to take a stroll in the park? Out of the morning dress and into the walking dress. The skirts are shorter by several inches and didn't have a train, so they weren't dragging a leaf pile behind them as they went. The materials were usually rich in color and patterned to be admired amongst the greenery. When women returned home from their daily walk, they would change in dress number three, or the afternoon dress for receiving visitors or visiting others. The skirts had a longer train and the neckline was usually a little lower. After some visiting time, dress number four gets whipped out for dinner and it was the most formal of all casual dresses. Usually silk, satins, velvets, exactly the type of precious material you want to spill food on. Ball gowns weren't for regular wear, but they were required for fancy occasions so you had to own them too. Morning garb, and I don't mean pajamas, is number seven in our countdown. Known as the monarch of morning. Queen Victoria influenced how grieving women dressed and behaved in Europe and the United States after the passing of her husband in 1861. She famously mourned him for 40 years until her own demise and started what's now known as the Victorian morning etiquette. Vic 
Victorian mourning etiquette came with elaborate rituals to commemorate their dead. It became normal to have incredibly elaborate and lavish funerals, curtail social behavior, and even erect statues and ornate monuments as tombstones. Mourning clothes were part of this and they were introduced for both sexes. Said to show a family's outward display of their inner feelings after the passing of a loved one, the rules for who wore what and for how long were complicated and often outlined in popular journals or household manuals. Call that a mourner's magazine. Jokes aside, men definitely had it a lot easier. They simply wore their usual dark suits along with black gloves, hat bands, cravats, or ties. For women, especially should she be a widow, there were different levels of mourning and garb to wear as you progressed out of deep mourning and into lighter mourning and so forth. Deep mourning uh, was of course black, but also made specifically was a crepe styling, a scratchy silk with a puffed crimped appearance associated with mourning as it doesn't pair with any other clothing. Right. The mourner would eventually stop donning the crepe and then stop donning black. This was called slightening the mourning before cloth colors eventually moved on to gray, mauve, then white until the mourning period was considered complete. Number six in our countdown is the human hair wearers. Fun because it rhymes, but creepy for a whole slew of reasons. So, what do I mean by human hair wearers? Well, it was a tradition in Victorian era to don jewelry that had segments of human hair embossed, woven, or sealed into it. But for many Victorian people, the amount of hair involved in remembering loved ones went far beyond a little lock in a necklace. In stores and women's magazines, you could find patterns for wreaths made of hair and wire, often floral designs. Bracelets, brooches, earrings, and necklaces were also all very common. In its prime, human hair, jewelry, and decor was considered incredibly fashionable. It's even said that swapping locks of hair was a love token between women loving women or friends the way that girls today might wear friendship bracelets with each other. I guess if you need a trim and you were already late on a birthday gift, you could really just kill two birds with one stone. Number five in the countdown is all about buggy dresses. The wealthy Victorians were very into the grandeur, looking to feed a fascination with culture especially. Beetle wing embroidery was at a peak of fame in the 18th century India and was quickly appropriated by English visitors while military occupied the country from 1858 to 1947. Elytra, which is the hard casing over a beetle's wing, first appeared on dresses and experienced their first burst of popularity in England by the 1820s, though English women in India had likely been donning it since at least the 1780s. Material used was often white or other pale colors to help augment the reflective green tones of the beetle wing. This visual was made possible when Elytra was paired with Zardozzi, a gold embroidery style often done on colored cottons or silks. Victorians at least didn't appropriate everything about the art form. They made patterns and styles of their own for the dresses. Elytra was sewn onto the gowns in an imitation of live beetle patterns, a reflection of Victorian interest in naturalism and zoology. Not sure why anyone wants to look like they have live bugs crawling on them, but okay. Number four is the casual ball gown. One of the most notable shifts in Victorian time was that fashion began to be differentiated by gender rather than class. This reflected the changing roles of women in society. And let me say, every part of Victorian women's fashion seems tortuous. You start your day layering on long, crotchless underwear and tunics before strapping a metal cage to your waist. You then wear an average of six skirts over that, alongside bodices and corsets that would forever change the placement of your organs and potentially even suffocate you to death. The reported average weight of a Victorian dress when fully on could be anywhere between 14 and 22 pounds. But the risk doesn't end there. In fact, it was everywhere. It was estimated that between the 1850s and 1860s, 3,000 women in England died from their crinolines catching fire, as airy fabrics and hoop supported skirts also allowed for plenty of air to circulate beneath a dress, which could also make a small flame grow out of control in seconds. In 1860, the New York Times reported that 40,000 women worldwide perished from dress related fires. Another common occurrence was to see them pulled into machinery after walking too close and having some of the skirts catch in exposed parts. Yikes. It's no wonder that the large ball gown crinolines phased out in the late 1800s, but then bustles came in and they were worse in different ways. While more practical as it was slim on the sides and the front, it required women to sacrifice movement and comfort in order to achieve a fashionable shape like the 
course it did. They began to alter women's spines, ribs, and organs over time as they required women to twist their bodies completely in order to be able to sit down. Overall, while movies and TV may make these beautiful gowns seem whimsical and ethereal, they truly were just death traps. Number three in the countdown is bird brained. I enjoy my puns, but there's a reason for that one. This trend was started by the notorious Marie Antoinette, a rebel in the French courts for her outlandish fashion and accessories. Amongst her pile of powdered curls, Marie was often seen with feathered caps and bonnets. While this look became an envy for women across America and Europe, the trend did struggle to take off initially as much of the aristocracy was perturbed by it. However, a trend is a trend, and eventually the English society was persuaded. They donned mainly ostrich, pheasant, or peacock feathers at first. Eventually entire songbirds were stuffed after their death and adorned these hats. By the late 1800s, the plume trade had decimated several species of birds, including flamingos, birds of paradise, and rosy spoonbirds. Topping the endangered list were the snowy and great egrets, as at one point their pure white feathers were worth more than gold. Promoters of the feather trade knew what they were doing and also knew that the public didn't understand the carnage that their fashion was sieging on these animals. They held that wearing feathers and whole birds brought city dwellers closer to nature, that it improved people's awareness and knowledge of bird species. Thankfully, it's due to the inevitable public awareness and then disapproval that bird hat sales diminished and went out of trend altogether. Number two slot in the countdown is Paris Green. It seemed Parisian aristocracy had a chokehold on the globe with their trends. It's believed Empress Eugenie was to have worn a dress so stunning at the Paris Opera one evening in 1864 that it was featured in newspapers globally the next day. It was a deep yet vibrant green, one rumored to almost glow in darkness. The green of Paris quickly became the hue of the social elite. So how was Paris green made and why was it so dangerous? The color was discovered when chemists combined copper and arsenic poison. The result was a dye brighter than all the other greens available on the market. Copper wasn't what gave this color its iconic nickname however. Arsenic is a highly hazardous substance that causes skin sores, vomiting, diarrhea, and in some circumstances cancers or death, as we know now. But they didn't. When factory workers arms and hands began to wilt away from sores and decay that could only be connected to the dye, French and German governments enacted legislation prohibiting the production of arsenic based pigments. It's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, the British government mainly ignored them. Even when Matilda Schreuer famously died of arsenic poisoning with the whites of her eyes stained green from her working in factories. This was deemed accidental poisoning by the government at the time. Paris green remained popular in England until ironically it just went out of trend. It's a little bit of an abrupt ending honestly. No justice for those exposed in workplaces or compensation for suffering. But nothing takes the cake quite like the Victorian trend of looking dead, which is number one in our countdown. You'd figure people look dead enough as is inhaling arsenic and mercury from their clothes and shoes and hats constantly, let alone their home decor. But looking dead was the fashion of the day. This look was specifically modeled after how tuberculosis affected you. Pale skin, watery eyes, red lips. While this disease was decimating the lower status, higher status women recreated it with makeup and arsenic consumption. You heard me right. In order to get pale skin, women consumed arsenic. In order to not die from arsenic, the consumer had to follow a careful process, eating small doses to build up a tolerance. Now, arsenic is addictive, so if they at any point stopped the consumption, they would experience withdrawals such as vomiting, stomach pains, convulsions, hair loss, nervous system failure, kidney failure, delusions, the list goes on. Some women were stuck taking it for the rest of their lives. For the desired watery eye look, women would put citrus or even perfume in their eyes. Some went farther, using belladonna flower, also known as deadly nightshade, for longer lasting tears. However being poisonous, little wonder why blindness was a widely reported as a symptom of belladonna drops. No wonder it did such a good job. Red lip paint included? You guessed it, more poison. In this case, usually lead. All of these poisonous products would contribute to illnesses and facial decay. Death was of course a long term side effect of the usage once poisoning reached its crescendo. Suffice to say, while you may really want to fit in, some trends are not worth getting on board for, especially if they'll slowly melt your face off. Getting us started at number 10 is top hats. A top hat is an iconic image. You can see them in old black and white movies or on logos such as Mr. Peanut. But why were top hats created and why were they so trendy? Well, there's multiple reasons actually. Men and women were already wearing hats and bonnets to protect their heads from rain, wind, and the soot from local smokestacks. As a result, hats were already quite a trendy wear. 
However, the true reason for its popularity is what it represented. The top hat quickly became symbolic of status, power, and masculinity. From 1850 to 1900, men wore top hats for business, pleasure, and formal occasions. Certain colors were even associated with certain times of day. For example, a black top hat was for day or night, making its wearer feel taller, more handsome, even suave. Some were even reported to be a height of 12 to 14 inches tall. Top hats, amongst other hats of this era, also required ridiculous upkeep, such as being brushed, boiled regularly, powdered, etc. They also tend to contain mercury poison. As time progressed, we found other ways to overcompensate as well as accessorize our heads, so it's easier to see why the top hat never made a comeback. Number nine in the countdown is women and their flirty fans. When you see a gentleman caller across the room, you may want to send him a hint that you're picking up the vibe that his top hat is putting out. What better way than subliminal messaging with an item you're already carrying? In Victorian times, women carried fans due to fainting spells, which were really just the result of their excessively tight and heavy garments, something we'll cover later in the video. In 1827, a fan maker from Paris, Double Roy, published a leaflet explaining the language behind the uses of a fan. Some examples were twirling the fan in the right hand meant that I love another. Meanwhile, drawing the fan across the cheek told someone special that I love you. A fan half opened and pressed to the lips gave permission for a kiss. However, it is rumored that the less romantic truth is that the fan etiquette, such as Duval Roy's leaflet, was invented in order to boost the sales of fans in the 19th century after they had fallen out of fashion following the French Revolution. Irregardless of rumors, it appears in olden times some people were using fans to get hot rather than cool down. Speaking of keeping it cool, next in our countdown at number eight is bottomless underwear. While showing a bit of ankle may have made you a harlot, in the Victorian era, every woman was walking around with crotchless undergarments. But these strange underoos were invented with a justified purpose. Due to the amount of fabric layers, steel crinolines, and tight bodices and dresses, women of the era didn't really have time to spend an hour undressing before nature calls. By creating undergarments that had holes aligned with the wearer's groin, a woman's only mission would be to hoist up as many layers as she could before popping a squat. Don't be fooled however, that wasn't exactly easy either. Some of you may wonder, what happened if Aunt Flo paid a visit while a woman was wearing an open bottom undergarment? Well, in Victorian times, menstruation hygiene was perceived very different and women quite literally let it flow. If you want to learn more, search that one up on your own. As fashion evolved and women wore fewer and lighter clothes in the early 20th century, pulling down undergarments from underneath bustles and cages was no longer a nightmare, so the crotchless undergarment was soon abandoned once more. But now it does make sense why everyone loved the high kicking can can dancers in 19th century Paris. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm going to bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, People needed to travel for business, or more specifically, men needed to travel for business, which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today, bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. 
I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five, big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me, and it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no, commonly called self-pollution, which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his chair or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just as long as the bedroom doors close, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything. And if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it. Cause with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did, and I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad. So a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day. Cornflakes by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching, so sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled. Reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms. But that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Because science. Kicking off the list at number 10, a lot of hair. To kick off this wild part two, I had to include the tale of the woman who ate her own hair. 
Why did she do it? What happened? How much hair? Well, let's find out. All the questions about to be answered. The Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 got the attention of those passerbyers with this one. A 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. That's not too far off from the average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case, this case was a little odd. Something was off about it. So doctors asked the family if they could carry out a post mortem. And lo and behold, a two pound solid chunk of hair was sitting in her stomach. It caused ulcerations of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. What a horrible way to go out. The woman's sister didn't know that over the last dozen years or so, she had been casually eating her own hair. Just one piece every now and then. Ultimately, it added up. If you know anybody that's eating their own hair, pass this on. Send them this video. This sounds rather uncomfortable. Number nine, cat attack. If I have to pick, I would say I'm 100% a dog guy. Cats are cool, don't get me wrong, but this next story freaks me out a bit. Also, I had a cat once and I pulled its tail on it. <laughs> hissed at me and scratched me and scared the life out of me. So, dog, dogs for sure. Back in 1870, a rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. What a fun little hobby and lifestyle. She had tons of cats, she loved them all equally, and they loved her. I'm allergic also, so this story is my nightmare on a level. But it does sound like a cute time, I'll admit, that's a nice way. Especially like in the Victorian era, what a, what a lovely little pocket of fun. 1800s, a lot of candles, everything being extremely flammable, disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out of this young woman's home, and the cats were sadly trapped in the house. They made it out alive, but by the time they made it out, the two maids that had kicked the door open to rescue them, they had gone full primal. The cats just attacked them and it was all bad. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both attacked by them at full force, essentially, all of these cats. It's like, what a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives, you know what I mean? Number eight, quick divorce. Let's just say the love thing isn't working out, okay? It happens, people change, but now what? Say it's the Victorian era, but divorce in England isn't allowed until 1857. And it's 1856. So now what are we gonna do? Well, considering what list we're on and which part it is, it's pretty wildly unfair. If you were the wife, you were getting sold in this scenario. How horrible is that? Wife sellers, they were a thing. That was a legitimate business, how horrible. Yeah, you were getting sold if you were the wife. How horrible is that? Wife sellers was a legitimate business. There were auctions, public auctions would be done. You would watch people bid on marrying your wife. At like noon, middle of the day, people are walking by like, oh, do I have any change, hang on. This is insane. One real sale that happened in 1862 was in Selby. The asking price was a beer. The asking price for this person's wife was one pint. Sold, just like that, that's crazy. Sold, drank, now I'm married. That's insane. Other times, most of the time, it was a rather expensive exchange. I feel like there are plenty of cases where this would honestly be the ideal scenario. Just get it done in one day, whatever, peace. See you again, bye, you're the worst. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely. And Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend, oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night? 
Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally, it flourished. Especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so... Uh... Number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there were some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on a liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now, we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victoria London or maybe some B-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias. Some say it was Prince Albert. There's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least, and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there, ladies. Just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blight herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband. Who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic. That's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that when next time, Bly. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror, the absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? Ah, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era, and who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more, we need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. 
The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time. Because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen, where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, pestilence fabrics. Last time I was talking about the Victorian era, I mentioned a few points on fabrics with harmful and dangerous chemicals, which happened more than it should have. Shouldn't happen at all, really. It's kind of sad. Well, that wasn't the only fabric related issue that was out to get you back then. For example, wealthy people couldn't be bothered to do their own laundry. I hate doing laundry, I don't blame you. I'm not wealthy though. And sometimes would have them washed and taken away by launders who, well, wash clothes to the rest of the city. Being that clothes and washers themselves were poor, or that clothes were just mixed around regardless, well, that was an issue. There was a lot of sickness going around at the time, and well, it was contagious. A lot of times, these sicknesses would cling to fabrics and when given back to their customers, well, they could very well come down whatever London was feeling at the time. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun. I, I, I think I'll just wear more of my dirty stuff. I'll just wear my underwear for six months straight. It was white when I bought it. Not anymore, but it's okay. Number six, lead. Here we go again. Lead, just lead in general. It was used in so much stuff. Seriously, it, it, it's scary. Especially because they knew it was harmful. It wasn't a secret, they knew. Uh, I was gonna pick one leaded item, but I, I mean, I couldn't. I mean, seriously, I know this is a list about fashion, but it was involved in some clothes making processes, it was, it was in women's makeup, which that's also fashion, and it was in house paint, which I know that's not technically fashion, but it kinda is. Trust me, I used to mix paint before I was an internet comedian. I know the history of paint. Ask me your paint related questions in the comments below. I'm the guy you need to talk to. I mean, it was used in pipes too, and we drank out of those, it's just crazy. Now, it is one of those things that minor exposure to is fine, sure, but the thing was with fashion and beauty is that you probably would use said product every day, like the clothing or the makeup, and especially the makeup of the ladies. Lead poisoning symptoms include headaches, stomach pain, constipation, infertility, and memory loss. Yikes, that's not fun. We don't like that here. Number five, corsets. Nobody wants a waist bigger than nine inches, said everybody in Victorian times. I for one can appreciate the female form and the hourglass figure. It's admirable, sure, but that being said, I, I don't think we need to go so far to keep the female form in shape. The corset's a little too much. Corsets were those chest tightening, gut sunking, push all to mince meat to the top of the pie, apparel that went under every woman's dress or every fat dude in his 50s who wants to feel 29 again. I don't think I have to tell you why this is bad or uncomfortable. The human chest needs to breathe, and when something's that tight around you, well, you struggle to breathe. Uh, trouble breathing, fainting were not all too rare, especially in hot and humid climates. For my generation, you may recall Elizabeth Swan had issue with hers in Pirates of the Caribbean. And then she fell, and then Jack Sparrow caught her, and it was a good movie. But don't, the corsets, I just, I can't get behind them. Number four, foot binding. While not exclusively done in the Victorian era, it was started in ancient times and continued all the way up until the 20th century, thus includes the Victorian era. A Chinese fashion tradition that takes women's feet and binds them and squeezes them until they begin to change shape. Oh, poor ladies. Again, I don't think I need to tell you that forcibly changing bone and muscle structure in your feet just for fashion 
is a bad idea. I think you all know that. For starters, it doesn't look right. After years of binding, the shape of the foot drastically changes. Secondly, the health risk of doing such is not worth it. Oftentimes, toenails fall off or become infected. Ugh, gross. Bones break and pierce skin. It's a bad time all around. Thank God we stopped doing that, right? Jeez. Oh, thanks. Number three, lard wigs. Wigs have been around for a long time. If you're a fancy politician from Washington, you wear a powdered wig, singing Yankee Doodle Dandy all the way to the Capitol building. Balding men, women, or really anyone can wear a wig. It's, it's really for everyone. What I'm getting at is it's been around for a long time and we've come a long way. Given enough time and asked to tell the difference, I probably couldn't. I, I, really, I really couldn't point out a wig if, if you showed me. So we're getting really good at it these days. That being said, in the Victorian times, wigs were quite common and were fashioned with a peculiar substance. Lard, yes. Imagine every day of the week without proper baths or showers and living in close proximity to the Thames River. And you take a handful of pig lard and just slather that in your wig to style it. Put a gross sound effect in there, just gross sound, ugh. Do you imagine the smell? This is the most offensive hair crime since frosted tips in the early 2000s. Those were a big mistake too, I gotta say. Not, I had them, but it wasn't. there's only one man who can pull that off. And he's in Flavortown, you know what I'm talking about. Number two, German helmets. 1914 was the end of the Victorian era and the beginning of the modern era. It's actually a very fascinating time. It's kind of like modern meeting the past, really cool. Well, fashion just doesn't mean civilian. Anyone who's ever spent time in the Marine Corps knows that they gotta look their best. Wow, Marines. The Empire of Germany was no different in 1914, and a lot of German soldiers wore helmets with an ornamental spike, like a Koopa from Super Mario. I know you guys have seen the movies, you, you, you've seen them. Except the main issue here wasn't an overweight Italian plumber jumping on their heads, uh, but the war and the enemy itself. World War I was fought in a lot of trenches, so it's kind of awkward when you can see a bunch of little spikes moving up and around the enemy's trench. It's also kind of dangerous to have an extra piece on your helmet as you can get caught in weird places like barbed wire. And yes, if you're wondering, sometimes they were used in the absence of a good melee tool. Yeah, you'd be correct, sometimes they did. You gotta do what you gotta do. Oh, brutal. Number one, French uniforms. More World War I, but it's still Victorian. It counts, I promise. While the spiked helmets were a very bad idea, they were shortly phased out. They learned their lesson. However, the French stood up and said, no, 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 I have a worse idea. Also, shout out to France. You guys get a bad rap for the war, but it's really your war. You guys rock the man. You guys are the best. Love France. Anyway, the French uniforms were a little bit of a mistake. In a classic case of fashion over function, kind of the theme of this list, they wore very bright and blue red uniforms. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but bright blue doesn't exactly blend into an environment. Thus, it made French soldiers a very easy target. Everything's like gray, black, and brown, and you're just wearing bright blue and red pants. Yeah, you're gonna, you're not gonna make it far, Chief. Number 10, the hobble skirt. This is a bad idea written all over it. The hobble skirt, also jokingly called the speed limit skirt, was a dress with a very tight hem, making the poor lass who's wearing its movement, well, not having much of it. Can't have the wife running off from her home now. <laughs> Even if that, you know, that meant the home was not a good place and men acted really bad back then. But no, you can't have her running away. Apparently though, some were so tight that it caused women to fall. And in some extreme cases, I, I can't believe this, those falls were fatal. What? Number nine, muslin dresses. Honestly, I can see celebrities doing this today. Okay, so the female figure. It's sleek, it's curvy, it's Gorgeous. Today a girl's got some options on how she wants to flaunt what her mama gave her. You go girls. But back then, well, not, not so much. Except for the muslin dress apparently, which I find strange at the time since seeing a woman's ankle could give a guy a stiff neck for hours, if you catch my drift. Essentially this was a dress that you had to wet first, like a, a gentle misting if you will. Yeah, weird right? And then you'd wear it out. Now for the summertime, this makes sense, and honestly, I might support this myself actually. See the curves, stay cool, however some stories tell us of women who wore this during cooler weather and then got sick. Fashion over function ladies, be careful, that's a silly one. Oh, 40 below, I better wear my muslin dress, yes, I'm just gonna walk out. <laughs> Number 8, ladies wear. Okay, this is a general one, but ladies dresses and wear in general was just ridiculous. I mean, I mean those big poofy dresses, it just seems like ladies had it rough. When have they not? Wear a dress that's too tight or so big you struggle to walk around. Not to mention the fancies of dresses have wire, wood cages and frames. Just 
making walking around more difficult because yeah, that makes sense. For me, anytime I wear formal wear, I keep an eye out for bathrooms. You never know when you need to go. However, I just can't imagine trying to squeeze the lemon on those bad boys. Whew, that would be difficult. To make matters worse, there are stories of women wearing just regular big poopy dresses and then getting in accidents at factories. And yes, it was gruesome. And yes, they didn't make it out. And no, there's no movies about it. Stop asking. Number seven, The Great Famine. We're gonna lean out a wife selling for a hot minute and include the boys for this one. Yeah, come on back in, you're all guilty. The Great Famine took out everybody, not just Victorian women, of course. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population was relying on was no longer available all of a sudden. A group of microorganisms just wiped them out, just like that, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people that really needed it. So this famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. A little fun bit of history I had to include on this one. Number six, the Brooklyn Theater Stampede. And we're back to absolute horribleness. Here we go. I love the theater. When the pandemic shut down plays, I actually felt pretty sad. I like sitting in full rooms watching a guy in a fake wig monologue about Mozart. Like that's my ideal Saturday night. That's the best. I don't want that to not be a thing anymore. I love theater. But today we have an obnoxious amount of distractions that can take you out of the experience. Guy's texting fighting his ex-girlfriend two rows ahead of me. I'm trying to watch Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I'm like, man, it's not the same anymore. Theater's not the same anymore. Turn off your phone, throw a tomato at him. It can be distracting. Exit signs can also be pretty distracting, but we need them. We definitely need them. Because in 1876, the Brooklyn Theater caught fire after a single lantern fell over on stage during a performance. This was 1876. Everybody was wearing flammable attire. There aren't emergency exits yet. A fire marshal hadn't come in and counted heads at this point, so it was a disaster. 278 people lost their lives. A monument was put up after the incident. It shook the town, it was absolutely horrible. I read about this and I was like, that's horrible. We got included in, this is a horrible list. Number five, the hobble skirt. Yeah, so when people can't get out of burning theaters, it's stuff like this to blame. Just from this 1910 headline alone, I'm glad we don't have hobble skirts anymore. The June 12th, 1910 headline reads, the hobble skirt is the latest freak in women's fashions. The latest freak. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Nice. I'll take two, debit. Doesn't that sound like a bad time? Why would anyone want this? Sounds like you're gonna be late for everything. French designer Paul Poirier made these to free the bust, to free the, you know, have a lot of room in here, whilst shackling the legs. So you in turn have to, you can't move. Just what you need to move around uneven stone roads, I guess. Love the practicality on this one, Paul, thanks. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and acts, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Shoot, Ugh, oh, man, must be nice. I'll just be over here wearing jeans like an idiot. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons so they could, you know, actually walk around. Yeah, what fools. Oh, sorry, you want a button? <laughs> I don't speak broke, sweetie. Number four, lead based. When I started here at the studio a year and a half ago, maybe two years, I was like, okay, I gotta put on face cream maybe. A lot, of, a lot of lights, a lot of HD this. Time to get rid of these bags under my eyes finally. I don't know, maybe drink some water. See what happens. Finding a skincare routine of any sorts is easy now, dare I say. The lovely World Wide Web has our back. You can learn how to draw your eyebrows on while listening to true crime. It's wonderful where we are today. But the cosmetic game, whew, back in the 18th century, not great. Turns out, wasn't that great. Not that safe. RuPaul's drag race would have been a lethal sport, know what I mean? Back in the 18th century, lead mixed with vinegar was often used to make your face look, you know, more pale. The Victorian look, I guess, gotta have those veins pop out. A splash of sulfur for those freckles. Horrible idea. Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and or arsenic. The same poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. So, not safe at all in any time, period. In fact, arsenic was on the priority list of hazardous substances, and toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing in this era, let alone Victorian. Number three, the Kensington system. Ah, oh, this was horrible. Queen Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of before is awful. I was grounded more often than not growing up, I'll admit, you know, I was the youngest of three, so I tried some shady stuff every now and then, but this, this is another level. At least I could go to the washroom without supervision, you know what I mean? Yeah, buckle up. 
Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from friends, family members, anybody, everybody, you name it. Her mother would monitor her every action on top of this, including who she can see or speak to, if there were any of those people at some point. Victoria only had two playmates growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Fiodora of Lenigan, and then the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I had like four friends growing up, you know, maybe five, five and a half, but this is just cruel, this is just unfair. Especially with a royalty too, you'd think you can have more things. No, less. She shared a room with her mother until she was a queen. That entire time, she literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and yeah, in case you're wondering, she hates John Conrad. She referred to him as a demon incarnate, so she's got the words. Number two, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, literally. You've heard of arsenic and old lace at some point, but what exactly are we talking about? Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, real name, his wife, Fanny, also real name, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that of course she sadly didn't survive. But this was sadly common in Victorian days. Puffy dresses, open candles as we heard earlier. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is, but some of them were made with literal poison. Some of them had arsenic made to have that like green look, like the real arsenic green look. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and her fingernails had turned green and green foam started coming out of her mouth and it was just a horrible way to go out. Arsenic is not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Although yeah, it did look nice for a hot minute. Not worth it. And finally, number one, Queen Victoria's threats. Being the queen and all, and we're talking about the Victorian era, I figured we'd end with this one. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed, and during her reign, there were multiple, multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford, and he fired towards the queen's carriage, but obviously and luckily missed. But when Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. They were found guilty. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, thankfully, but of course, she was shook. Then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here, I saved it for last because it's extremely unsettling. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841. Edward Jones, AKA Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. It was some Assassin's Creed type stuff. He just knew some back way, he climbed some window or whatever. The guy just knew a route in. So he would break in and would more often than not just hide under the queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne sometimes and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers and like go through her clothes and stuff, it was creepy. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Of all the things you can do, of all the crimes you want to commit in the Victorian era, you're gonna go hide under a couch for five years? Okay, I'm glad he got caught, but just so weird. What a weird ending. Number 10, no calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7 Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally, because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Call on a man? <laughs> no way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm a little lonely. Number 9. Act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Ugh, oh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, 
You do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind? Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was. Especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby. Yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together, but given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Rule number seven is to mourn properly. Another dress all women owned was an all black morning dress. They kept these bad boys on lock for whenever someone died, which was arguably something to look forward to in the Victorian era. Thanks to Victoria being the most extraordinary and dramatic woman of all time when her husband Prince Albert died in 1861 and she spent a bajillion years dressing like a vampire and wearing black mantillas, it set this bizarre fashion and mourning standard that metamorphosized into literal rules. If one was to ignore these rules, it was seen as incredibly offensive to the deceased. Self-help books dedicated to making men and women better at exerting dramatic woe were pretty common to see on bookstore shelves. So a mourning rule for women was should her husband die, the widow is expected to mourn for no less than two years, while mourning for parents and offspring only lasted a year. Relatives such as grandparents and siblings would only get six months. They dole it out like family inheritance is a little weird. Queen Victoria had favored black crepe, and it became one of the only fabrics that was permissible for mourning clothing. Luxurious silks and satins weren't permissible, only itchy and abrasive materials that chafed the sadness right into you. Women would often wear merino or cashmere instead. No jewelry or ornamentation was permitted unless it served a functional purpose like a button or a clasp. Or unless it was a bunch of the deceased's hair and teeth braided in a pattern together in the jewelry. Don't forget your big black hat and grandma's doily tablecloth you dyed black to throw over your face and body. Enjoy looking like a corpse for two years. Rule number six is to glove up. We love to joke about the whole, oh no, if you show your ankle, you're a Victorian W word. But weirdly, hands were actually way more of an issue. The ankle thing was just because men were still trying to look up women's skirts, even when they were so long, the ends of them entered a room 15 minutes after the wearer did. Fingers were actually, <gasps> the gasp-worthy thing of the day. It was considered highly inappropriate to walk in public spaces with uncovered hands and would draw a lot of ill repute to those daring damsels who did. In fact, women's hands were so scandalous, both written and unwritten rules of Victorian etiquette unanimously agreed that if a man and a woman happened to be walking on an unevenly surfaced road, it was the one and only time that he could take her hand if they were unwed. Funny that the only permissible contact between the couple the yet to be engaged is to prevent her needing to be picked up from a Victorian pile of mud sludge. It does not matter where you are headed outside of your home, you must wear gloves, which weren't just a popular fashion accessory, but as stated, social necessity. Like every other item a woman could wear in this era, there were many kinds of gloves based on the occasion. For example, daytime was for short gloves, which usually bore designs, embellishments, whereas in the evening, gloves had feathers, satin ribbons, and other super flammable decorations. Rule number five is the modest dip. Because we're on the topic of acceptable fashions and modesty, a Victorian woman taking a dip at the beach pretty much looked the same as four burly men sitting in an ice fishing hut in Alaska. First of all, this was something only middle and upper middle class people could really do as it required money. You had to rent bathing machines, which looked like outhouses on wheels, but were really covered carriages that drove through the shallow water of the beach. There was a hole in the bottom that the ladies could stick their legs into or sometimes submerge their whole body, but that was ill-advised, not because the water was filthy, which it was, and riddled with corpses and poison to boot, but because creeps could come swimming up and see your bare legs. Can't afford the traveling outhouse? Well, 
No beach for you. Rule number four is wife sales, a real legal way to obtain a divorce in stuffy Christianized England. Divorce was unpopular, detested, and openly deterred in those days. Seeing as you were discouraged from intercourse with your partner, married them when you barely knew them, and could barely spend time alone with one another, it was a pretty popular request. You would have to sit listening to the clock tick and his nose being clogged, but him not blowing it for the 444th night in a row while you disassociate staring into a fireplace. What the hell did people expect, of course you want out. You don't even know his middle name. Attaining a divorce in the early 1900s was an expensive undertaking, however. So those who couldn't afford the legal fee sometimes sold their wives to the highest bidder. It was often done with the full consent of the wife, who was usually bought by her family, a new lover, or a female friend. It was an amicable way to say, this was a mistake, get out of my house, good luck and prosper. Rule number three is no flirting. As stated, you were really not supposed to flirt, and flirting to the Victorians included eye contact, talking to one another, looking at another person, breathing their air, knowing their name. Maybe the last one is dramatic, but you get my point. You wanted someone, you had to wait until you met them four or five times, then you could look at them, run into them a couple more times, then maybe request a dance at a ball, and you get one of those a couple times, then maybe you get a sit down chaperone visit, maybe a walk in the park, and a couple more ball dances. Then you can propose. But even then, a Victorian maiden could not be trusted alone with her fiance, lest her dainty, fluttering hand rest on the arm of her intent and cause an outburst that would inflame the fiance's uncontrollable base lust. Even after progressing through several stages of acceptable dating, aka the ball dancing, talking, walking together at a distance, if a man was invited to the woman's home, their acquaintanceship would still have to be under the watchful eye of a chaperone. Single women were never to indulge in behavior with a man that might lead to being kissed or handled in any way. This included strict inspection rules, because I kid you not, men were encouraged to inspect a woman back then. Like many of the stipulations that accompany shipping procedures. How romantic. If a man wanted to admire a necklace, the woman would have to remove it, hand it over for inspection. Under no circumstances was the item to be inspected while she wore it. Now I know where that flirting tactic came from because guys, y'all love that whole jewelry admiring flirt and it isn't subtle. And of course, during the chance encounters in one's club or in the park, staring boldly at someone you knew without acknowledging him or her, known as cutting, was the ultimate display of bad flirting manners in Victorian times. Guess they didn't like them bold back then. Rule number two is coming out. Not like that. Coming out in Victorian times meant a woman was tired of being in her parents' house, and if she wanted out of it, it meant she had to go find a semi-tolerable guy whose house she could move into in return for a cool ring on her left hand. This had to be a whole big announcement because to attend such events that a woman needed to to meet a potential suitor, she required the explicit permission of her mother. Only after stating her intent could the chaperones be organized because she can't go alone. Think of Bridgerton. Rich families might accompany the announcement with a series of parties or even a royal visit. Middle class families might hold a celebratory feast. Lower class families might not formally celebrate the announcement at all. Instead, the young woman just changed her appearance to show availability. This could be putting up her hair, donning a long dress, and accompanying family members to social events like church service, church dinners, festival balls. Coming out was best done during the in season, a literal term. It meant the four months from April to July where the upper class families up and down the country would send their teenage daughters to London. After flocking there en masse, the upper classes would congregate a series of balls and dances for the purpose of meeting, matching, and reproducing the next generations. At these events, the race was on to find someone with whom to make love. Again, this phrase of which, whose meaning has changed considerably over time. Making love in the Victorian age meant seeking out someone who might one day come to love you. This was done by eligible bachelors going up to girls chaperones, giving them a little card, requesting a dance with her. Her dance cards would be stacked in queue order in which the men got their dances and they were only allowed three per woman. End of the night rolls around and our maid will choose if she liked a suitor and have her chaperone return the card to indicate, oh yeah, buddy, it's on. Rule number one is how to travel, aka how not to have fun. Here's your duties when you're traveling as a Victorian lady. Listen up, take notes, dress appropriately. This is usually a dress similar to the morning gown, lighter and easier to move around in, but most importantly, plain and understated with few details. They would accessorize with dark leather gloves, straw bonnet, and of course, a travel corset, which was apparently said to be much less restrictive. Pick your seat carefully. It was customary for a woman Women traveling alone choose to see either next to another woman or an elderly gentleman. Women traveling alone were seen as prime targets for pitpocketers and thieves. It was usually only done to poor women without chaperone options, but all women, rich or poor, were instructed to keep only a small amount of customary spending cash on their person and give the bulk of their dough to their driver or escort to keep safe. Speak when spoken to, as only men were allowed to spark conversation.
conversation with a lady, never the opposite way around. Women were expected to respond politely and accept invitations to the refreshment saloon, even if they didn't want to go. That's because of the next rule. Never ever be rude while traveling, especially alone. It was imperative a woman act with the utmost class, even if being accosted by a persistent male passenger. But make sure you don't pester him. If a woman is traveling with a male companion, it's not appropriate to ask him such questions as, when do we get there? How far is it? You know you're making the wrong turn. Yes, you are. I know you are. I've been this way before. Look, that was the wrong way. How much time do you think that wrong turn added? Do you want to stop and grab something too? Yeah, no, strictly forbidden. Can't do that crap. But don't forget, you're also a babysitter to the because if the lady's male chaperone accidentally wandered into designated female compartments, it was her fault for either inviting him into the quarters or not alerting him of the specialized area. And lastly, while traveling, don't check yourself in. If a journey requires a stop at a hotel along the way, the lady would remain in the carriage while the driver or escort took care of all the room arrangements, likely because it was unheard of for a woman to make such a decision on her own. We're gonna start with one of the most famous tales out there. Number 10 is going to be spring Jack. It's very much an urban legend, mostly myth and nature, but there's some real encounters. So the Lord Mayor of London, John Colwyn, even had to come out in January of 1838 to address the growing numbers of stories about a man-like figure tormenting the late night walkers and playing ding dong ditch except with blue hellfire. While there are scattered accounts of Jack, there's really only two that have any real basis, and the first of which is Jane Alsop, who answered her doorbell in 1838 to a man yelling that they caught spring Jack and they needed assistance. When she opened her door, the man there blew blue fire at her while he shredded her clothing and skin with claws made of metal. Jane's sister intervenes and the attacker flees. Just days later, another attack takes place in a different part of London. Lucy Scales was walking with her sister when a shadowy man jumped out and also allegedly blew blue fire in her face, causing her to have a seizure. While many of the initial reports of Jack's attacks took place in outlying hamlets and villages, both the Alsop and the Scales case took place closer to the city and received a great deal more attention, stroking the fires of Spring Heel Jack's legend. He became a classic character of the cheap penny dreadfuls, and the elusive monster now belonged to Victorian nightmares. And unless you want to belong to Victorian nightmares, I suggest you subscribe to The Hive. Normally a matinee actor, there's no way William ever thought he'd be the closing act. Number nine. So William Terris had tried his hand at silver mining, medicine, sheep farm, and even tea planting in Bengal. This was a man who stuck his finger in every pie, and now they're all sticky, so he decided it was time to stick some toes in. He became a matinee actor. Not just any, either. William returned to England and quickly became one of the most popular matinee actors in the country. But for fellow actor Richard Archer Prince, Therese was a hindrance and a rival, and many accounts state he was not rocking a full set mentally. So it's in December of 1897 that Prince had tucked himself into a dark corner in Maiden Lane by the stage's back passage, waiting for Therese to arrive. When he does, Prince shoves a dagger through the man, and Therese is carried into the theater by other actors, only to die 20 minutes later in the arms of his distraught leading lady, Jesse Millward, as he uttered his final prophetic words, I will come back. Prince was arrested and sent to a secure unit, and he outlived his victim by almost 40 years, reveling in the infamy the killing had brought him. Alarmingly though, it seems, Turris was right, because it's not long after his death that ghostly occurrences began at the theater, ones that still gather tourists there to this day. Actors began hearing the strange tapping noises coming from the dressing room once used by him, and the sounds of unexplained footsteps also backstage. From time to time, the appearance of strange glowing lights or orbs are seen, and even the appearance of a human form floating above the stage area. Nowadays, staff say his spirit lingers mostly around the Covenant Garden underground station near the theater where his favorite baker used to be. For number eight, keep it straight because you might be seeing double. Doppelganger sightings have been reported throughout history in endless locations, whether ancient Egyptians, the Mexicas, or in Victorian England. Consensus is they are a horrible, horrible omen. In his biography, The Life of Dr. John Don, English writer I 
Isaac Walton shares a highly disputed account of poet John Don and his wife's doppelganger. One night in 1612, while staying in Paris, Don was discovered in a hysteria by his friend. I have seen a dreadful vision since I saw you. I have seen my dear wife pass twice by me through this room, with her hair hanging about her shoulders and death in her arms. Don reportedly had said to his witness, I cannot be sure that I now live than I have not slept since I last saw you, and I am sure that at her second appearing she stopped and looked me in the face and vanished. Walton then claims that a messenger was immediately dispatched to check on Dawn's wife, returning with the news she was in very poor health after losing a pregnancy. Then of course the Queen of Victorian Goth herself had to have connections to a doppel. Percy by She Shelley wrote of a double in Prometheus Unbound, and later claimed to have seen his own doppelganger before his death in 1822. His wife Mary Shelley later recalled that Percy had visions of strangling her, and mentioned an episode in which uh, his double had approached him. All of this was frightful enough, and talking it over the next morning, he told me that he had had many visions lately. He had seen the figure of himself, which met him as he walked on the terrace and said to him, How long do you mean to be content? You'd think identity fraud is a new crime. After all, it was next to impossible to get access to all of someone's personal info before the digital age. Right? Number 7. The Gattons In 1898, adult siblings Michael, Nora, and Ellen Murphy were on their way home Boxing Day after an entertaining day out. They made their way home after a dance had been cancelled. And sometimes it happens, but they still made the best of it, and you know what, I respect that. Enjoy your life, enjoy the afternoon, that's awesome. However, they never made it home. Their bodies were discovered in a grisly, bloody scene. I mean, really bad. Skulls were crushed, bodies were beaten, and someone had done in the horse. I mean, they, they shot the horse. That's crazy. No witnesses, I guess. To this day, nobody knows what happened to the siblings. It's really scary. <laughs> Number 6. Edwin Bartlett Edwin Bartlett, like many other people in the Victorian era, was in need of a good dentist. I could use one too. I need braces. I need braces. I'll be, be so cute with braces. A lack of dental hygiene made for many issues back then. So, if you take away anything from this list today, folks, it's brush your teeth and go see your dentist. It's important. Well, he went to the dentist because his breath had been so bad, he had to sleep in separate beds from his wife. He had so, he had so much buildup and gunk in there. It was that bad. Gross. For me, it's because I Far to my sleep, or at least so I'm told. That's what everyone says. I don't know. At the time, Mrs. Bartlett asked her husband to pick up a large portion of chloroform because that was legal back then. You just pick up some chloroform. Okay, sure. What a time to be alive. He later was found with chloroform in his system, a large amount. The missus somehow convinced the court that she was innocent. A study done almost 100 years later confirmed it was her. Well, at least maybe it was her. We're again still not sure because it was so long ago. Number five, Harriet Boozwell. Christmas morning, 1872, was a good morning for everyone waking up except Harriet Boozwell, who was found carved up like a Christmas goose. Oh God. The night before, she had attended a fancy Christmas ball, as you do back then, and she was seen leaving with a well-dressed, handsome man, a foreigner, most likely German, as witnesses report. She was found the next day with multiple lacerations, and uh, yeah, it wasn't pretty. The police eventually followed a trail of evidence to a German man in South America, but because of the man's pleasant demeanor and solid alibi, he was dropped as a suspect, even though his maid claims of cleaning a bloody handkerchief that night of her passing. No one else was ever arrested for the crime, and that was the end of that one. Oh yeah, the bloody handkerchief, yeah, that was, um, that was my brother. I had nothing to do with that. Yeah, it was not me, sorry. Number four, Elizabeth Jackson. Surprise, surprise, another mangled corpse was found in the River Thames. Hmm, that's weird. This time, the lower half of a woman and legs. As the days went on, more and more parts were discovered, and after another bad glue and paste project, it was identified to be Elizabeth Jackson, a young woman who had left her home in shame of an unwedded pregnancy. Ooh, scandalous. Sadly, she ended up in River Thames and no one is sure who did it at all. Some claim actually it was Jack the Ripper and while it does make sense, experts don't all agree. Thus, it is another unsolved mystery. God, that's why is it happening so much back then? What the hell's going on? God. Number three, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax and when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. That's a, that's a nice nursery. What a nice thing to say about a, ni a nice young lady. Maybe one of the most famous crimes ever, actually. In a nutshell, it looked like Lizzie had done it.
said, it was a it was a closed and shut case. It seemed like a pretty concrete open and shut case. But yet again, somehow she got off free. She claimed that she was in the barn when it happened, and then she discovered the bodies. Now, most of the topics on this list are a who done it, but I mean, for sure, this one we we can't be so serious to not ignore the facts here, right? I mean, she was the only person there who who could have done it. Oh, well, unsolved, apparently. Oh god. All right, she didn't do it. Number two, the West Ham vanishings. Just east of London between the years of 1882 and 1899, a few women disappeared and then were left in parks, or at least their bodies were. And I don't know why that keeps happening. It's just, it's, you know, 1800s is weird. And while we don't know very much about Jack the Ripper, we know even less about these cases, as They've somewhat fallen into obscurity. Naturally, police thought it could be Jack the Ripper again, but it's also likely that it's not. I'm starting to think Victorian London isn't the safest place for a lady to be. I'm, I don't like this is going. That's all the information on that one. It was like, yeah, they died. We don't know who did it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> all right. I'll put that in. Number one, Carrie Brown. This one takes place in 1881 Manhattan. Carrie Brown was found deceased in a hotel room. A man named Amir Abi was arrested and spent 11 years in jail for the crime before being proven innocent and released. So what's so crazy about this whole thing? Well, given the same style, the running theory was that again, this was Jack the Ripper even though this was New York and not London. So the question is really, who did Carrie in? And if it was Jack the Ripper, why is he in New York? And how many more did he really commit? In London and New York? Man, that's scary, dude, I don't know. Number 10, mudlarks. Victorian London, around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Yeah, a lot of sore throats, that's for sure. Everybody was sick all the time and the jobs that were available certainly did not help the cause. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. As their name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the muck that builds up alongside the Thames River. This one was reserved for younger folks, obviously, because it was like working in quicksand. If you were older, you would just get trapped. It was pretty sad. It was also exhausting, not to mention the chances of being washed away by the river were pretty high. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch, driftwood, rags, anything really worth your troubles. Number nine, chimney sweep. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house every now and then, whatever, and I personally, I loved it, you know? I thought I was the father of the house for a bit, getting in the chimney, getting all dirty and stuff, doing this, my hands on my, on my waist, I don't know, it's, that's, that's what a man was when I was younger. That little broom too, I love that little broom. I remember when I would do this, my grandmother, who is very English, she would be shook. She would watch the entire time. She would be taken back into time because this was a terrible job to have in Victorian London. I was, yeah, it was not the same at all. Chimney sweeps were famously young. I can't say anything else there in regards, but yeah, they were, we lads, to say the least. History is horrible. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that then made it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and then clean a chimney. Thank, thank God, I'm glad that stopped. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea I could have used this great law. Been like, actually, mother, a lot of claws. Number eight, funeral mute. Funerals suck, man. I was a pallbearer like three times before the age of 21. My one arm is just strong as now, that's it. I can lift anything just with one arm. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, right? Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Oliver Twist, one of those lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Funeral mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would essentially be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased home. Yeah, guy dies of a plague and you're like standing there like holding your breath like great, this is the worst job ever. You would then lead the coffin to the graveyard. So a lot of responsibility. Yeah, don't trip or breathe. Number seven, grave robbing. If ladies of the evening and cold blooded de-lifing have always been a part of life, then so it was grave robbing. The second someone was buried with anything valuable, there's been a creepier person on standby with a shovel. That's just how it goes. Poor Dompe from Zelda. Guy gets a bad rap. This was no different in Victorian times. However, while digging up corpses for baubles and trinkets was certainly done, there was a far more lucrative business, especially for those in the mad scientist business. <laughs> Sorry. People were paid under the coroner's table to dig up cadavers and retrieve them for doctors and medical professionals to conduct all sorts of freaky deaky stuff. 
Mostly just to learn, but you can be sure someone got a little weird with it. We always do, we always take it too far. Number six, Christmas fire. One of the things my mama always taught me was fire safety. My dad taught me how to deal with a bonfire after 10 beer, but well, mom's lesson was safer. Never leave the stove unattended. Put candles out when you're done and know your fire escape plan. You gotta know it, you never know. While this event may seem like a wholesome family fun on the holidays, I get anxiety just thinking about it. In Victorian times, families will play a game at Christmas called Snapdragon. You get a large dish or bowl or cauldron, I guess, large enough for everyone to gather around the table and fill it with a whole bottle of brandy. Then pour in some dates and large raisins. Then ignite said brandy ablaze and try to grab the blue flaming dates without getting burned. Folks, this is a time before modern firefighting techniques, burn medicine, and houses are just really close together. So one good fire could take down a whole block, maybe a city. Not a good idea, don't do this, don't recommend. Look, Mom, I got the flaming raisin, and now the curtains are on fire, wow! Number five, the potato famine. Potatoes have been a staple of many cultures' cuisines for centuries, partially because of their ruggedness, easy to grow attitude, and not only filling, but very delicious. Ooh, let me some fries. Good box of hot fries and some salt, baby. Let's go. Well, 1845 Ireland was a wee bit different as a fungus outbreak was taking hold of the mighty potato harvest all over the country, thus creating a large famine that would see one million people or more perish in a large famine. Queen Victoria tried to help, but was extremely ineffective. And by help, well, I mean the same effort I put into reading books assigned to me in high school. Sorry, Miss Middleton, I used Cliff Notes. I'm sorry, I did. I used, I'm sorry, I love you, Miss Middleton, you're the best. But I read like 10 pages out of the book, so that's gotta count for something, right? Right? Number four, the Napoleonic Wars. Like World War I, this time can be stretched to include Victorian England. Why is this event so dark? Well, because Napoleon wasn't going to stop. France had recently discovered what freedom was, and sacre bleu, it tastes amazing! <laughs> and they overthrew their government. Napoleon surprised everyone by being an amazing general. Dude took on multiple nations at once, and won multiple times. It's extremely impressive. However, in a classic case of went to his head, he became the leader of France and declared himself the first consul of France, or emperor in other terms, and started stripping away rights, especially from women, which sucks, like a construction worker who kicks off his boots at 5 p.m. I know you're out there, you guys just, you just kick them off. Just get rid of them, those boots, they're stinking. He invaded other European nations and was on a path to destruction until the international community put, him to, put, put a stop to it. They said no more, dude. Number three, dirty, it's dirty, in it? Oh, it's dirty. It should be noted that the streets of Victorian London were not clean at all. Maybe the filthiest, maybe the filthiest ever. It was so bad that in 1858, the Great Stink occurred, which basically was all the refuse and filth piling up in the River Thames. Combined with a heat wave in the summer, the issue had literally been mounting for years and now would come to an offensive bubbling over. Oh, that must be awful. The smell was so bad it was making people sick and people were most likely getting sick from the river from cholera outbreaks. God, that's disgusting. Cholera was more common than you'd like to think. It took some serious engineering and a lot of pumps to fix the sewage issue that was severely outdated. It wasn't fully fixed until 1875. Keep your soap and your hand sanitizing here, my folks. It's gonna be a little greasy. Number two, ladies of the evening. Oh yes, the streets of Victorian England were filthy, all right. And if every street corner was a lovely lass for lowering her dress in hopes of luring in a customer, as they say, oh yes, she shan't have to wait long, as this type of business was more common and profitable back then than you'd really like to think. Personally, I don't see why it is illegal or still is, especially if it becomes regulated. I mean, why not? Let, let them do what you gotta do. However, it was bad. There was a lot of sickness and bedroom related sicknesses. It wasn't good, it was horrible. I just fell off the box. Sorry, I'm an idiot. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Oh, not much I can say about this guy that YouTube won't let me say, so here we go. The first serial unaliver to do what they do in the pale moonlight. The streets of Victorian London were crowded, dirty, like I said, and oftentimes chaotic. So for a true psychopath like Jack to exist only makes sense. He was kind of a ghost. He was responsible for the passing of several women who worked the streets and, uh, well, 
they were really violent crimes. We can't show you, but we'll show you a picture of Jack in a cloak or something, maybe on the moonlight or something like that. The worst part is he was never caught, like ever. Not, they, we don't, we never got him. Or he was a she, or he was multiple people. We, we just don't know, there's many theories, but because of technology at the time and, and crime solving things, we just, we just didn't, we, we didn't get him. Number 10, Jack the Ripper. If we were to pick a poster boy for this list, well, it'd be him. Jack the Ripper was the alias given to the unknown criminal with sick tastes. During a period in the late 1800s, there was a string of cold-blooded de-lifings that affected London, Victorian London to be specific. It got so bad that they were telling people not to go out at night in fear of the Ripper. Ooh, that does not sound good. His crimes were extremely graphic and violent and meant for a much more mature and suitable audience. Just to make things even worse, he was never caught or really even fully identified. Some of the theories say he was a she, he was multiple people, or even Prince Albert. They thought it was Prince Albert at one point. They, they really don't know. Oh, that's terrible. That's just awful. Right, I'll go out with you, but your Ripper could be out. Number nine, Charles Bravo. Mr. Bravo succumbed to his illness in 1876. He had been poisoned with atimony, which at first when I read that, I thought it said alimony, and I feel like a lot of husbands died of that. That's a divorce joke for everybody at home. With atimony, which is a poison that works very, very slowly. Slowly enough that he would have known what was happening. Thus, he quite possibly knew who did it, but never never revealed who did. Now, at the time, it was believed to be a manual checkout, if you will. What's crazy about this case, though, is that it's like a game of Clue. The wife was having an affair with the doctor, so, you know, there was something there. There was also a disgruntled maid who all wanted a piece of Mr. Bravo. Mm, yes. The family fun game night conclusion was it was the wife in the library with the candlestick. I meant the poison. She poisoned him. It, it, it was her with the poison. I th we think. That's the running theory. We still don't know. Number eight, Thames Torso. The Thames River is famous for being a stinky, rotten, no good, very bad river filled with the most heinous refuse humans have to offer. That's right, love. It's awful, isn't it? Oh, it's bloody awful. Yes. So, to some, it shouldn't be a surprise that in September of 1873, a woman's torso was recovered from the river. Hold on to your barf bag, folks, because it's only going to get worse from here. There was also lungs, a right thigh, a right shoulder, and lastly, a scalp with a face, and, and it is attached. It is gross. Ooh, they found that as well. Authorities did their best to reconstruct the body, but uh, this isn't a Malibu plastic surgery office. They even sat out the face on display in hopes the public could identify the victim. One man suspected it was his missing daughter, but a positive ID could not be made. Thus, we know nothing about the case. Number seven, toilet troubles. Now, the Victorian era was unsanitary, to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect, right? Go to the bathroom and may not come out. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was that of the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole, you know, methane gas problem. We gotta really deal with that one first and foremost. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. This would, uh, this is how, every time you take a shit, you were worried that you might just, Woo! It was horrible, that's so scary. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time with human waste. Human, a, a, a lot of human waste. Built up in the sewers and then eventually would back up into your homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and your bathroom's gone. Just like that. Now we have poopery. You know what that is? You ever see a little spray and after you go, you just, you hide what you've done with one little spray at your friend's house. It's fascinating how far we've come. Number six, stairs. Yeah, believe it or not, stairs were a common danger in Victorian times. I'm somebody personally who falls up and down stairs a lot. I'm 6'2", I'm lanky as shit, I have like a Gumby body, I walk around like Woody, I'm always falling up and down stuff, it's horrible. Especially in Canada, it's so slippery, I'm always, always slipping all the time. In Victorian times, I would have been doomed. Houses were thrown up comedically fast, there wasn't a Mike Holmes on Holmes to come in and check it out, there wasn't a building inspector that made things, you know, safe. Servant staircases, they were tiny, they were out of sight, they were built into these narrow walls, often missing steps that they had to and cut corners just to, you know, be narrow and out of the way. That plus a tray of hot soup and a lot of clothing, yeah, it was next to impossible to move around without something happening. A lot of fatalities and staircases. Even today, around 12,000 people die each year falling downstairs. Hold on to that railing. I'm here to remind you, to hold on to that railing. It's crazy. There's actually no stairs there. I just made that whole thing up. Hit that like button for magic. Number five. Burke and hair. Medical schools were offering a handsome fee for deceased bodies to study. This was 
is an odd time. So an unhealthy amount of Victorians came up with this new solution. They thought they were brilliant. Yeah, they would rob graves. They would just go and rob the freshest graves they could find. They would wait in the bushes until the funeral's over, and then they would go and Disgusting. It got so out of hand that family members were actually guarding the graves of recently deceased overnight. That's how bad it got. That's disgusting. But nobody goes down in history like William Burke and William Hare. They were an unlikely duo, to say the least. They wouldn't wait until the body was done living. You know what I mean? They would actually kill people and rush the process, all for a pretty penny. 16 victims in total between 1827 and 1828. It took 16 victims for people to start catching on to this weird plan. The pair would lose victims into their house, fill them with alcohol, and then they would suffocate them. They had a sick system and they would suffocate them because the body needed to be in the best condition possible in order to receive a payout from the Edinburgh University Medical School. So they would, you know, try and keep it as clean as possible, which is horrible to say, but it makes sense. The Anatomy Act in 1832 put an end to this horrific plan. Number four, bird hats. Look, I don't have much to say about this next one here because, well, all right, yeah. I love a good hat. I've worn a few hats here throughout my time on Bumblebee, some baseball caps, some beanies here and there, sure. I've never worn a dead bird on my hat though, and I don't think that I will. That's for certain, I might just leave that out. Taxidermy was a hot topic back in Victorian London. Folks would rock the dead beaver bowler hat, any animal they would just prop up there, and it was considered fashion at the time, believe it or not. It was a dangerous trend though long term. Conservationists were saying that 67,000 species of birds were all at risk of extinction due to this crazy dead bird hat craze. Can you imagine just a stuck seagull on my hat? I'm like, all right, number five, here we go. It's crazy. Also, that's like a lot of weight, you know what I mean? A lot of weight on your head, just kind of, oh sorry, there's just a dead pigeon on my head, so my neck's kind of sore. What if the wings opened up and you kind of just like got some air? Maybe that's why they did it. Number three, holiday cards. Today, these Hallmark holiday cards, they go way too hard. And they also have a card for everyone and everything, you name it. Birthdays, weddings, stepdad's name day, you're like, what? That's so specific. Like they have everything covered. But back in the 1800s, these holiday cards, they were brand new. Nobody knew what to write or say, so they would just end up sending these artistic sentimental scenes. It would be like a frog in a top hat riding a bike. No caption, just that. You'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas, I guess. It'd be like a carrot with a face. It'd be a haunting image, really, to receive from a loved one on Christmas, but it's the thought that counts, I guess. This holiday season, just give your parents a card with this on it, and then see what they do. Don't even write anything. Just stare at them in the corner, all Victorian-like, and be like, Mother, father, Merry Fortnite Christmas. I don't know what they would say. Number two, lots of arsenic. We of course have to mention a big problem in the 1800s. Arsenic, everywhere, all at once, okay? Skin lotion, tons of cosmetics, it was a nightmare. Even if you didn't use any facial cream or anything, it was everywhere else. It was in wallpaper, it was in dresses, it was in toys, medicine. My gosh, it really was horrible, it's a nightmare. And it's because arsenic was cheap at the time. It was during the Industrial Revolution. It was being unearthed more and more and finally, come 1851, the Arsenic Act was passed, which fixed a lot of issues. Yeah, we regulated that one not soon enough, but we definitely got that one fast. And finally, number one, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, we've got to end on a horrific note. Everybody's just finding out now about Jeffrey Dahmer, it seems. He's a hot topic on Netflix. But what about Jack the Ripper? How did he get away with it this entire time? Why aren't we going to see a Netflix doc on him? ever. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily targeting sex workers in the area. Now at the time, the murders of five women from August to November of 1888 were believed to have been connected somehow to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active even until 1891. Again, we're never going to know at this point. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims. I can't really say anything else because it's disgusting, but yeah, he knew some things, disgustingly. And while there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was still never identified. Number 10, Queen Victoria's passing. Some say it ended the Victorian era, but it actually kind of extended a little while past that. She was the longest reigning queen at the time and a symbol of Great Britain's power. She also wasn't the nicest. Uh, she oversaw the conquering of India, which pretty bad. The Special Flower Wars in China, which saw China give five of its major cities to the British Empire, including Hong Kong, which kind of an awkward one there too. So yeah, her passing was sad for most, but for others, especially foreign nations, it was a reminder that their brutal overseers are still there, and they're probably still going to rule for another like 70 years. Oof. 
Number nine, World War I. This is considered to be the end of the Victorian era, and it makes sense, especially the first half of the war. It was a mixture of Old World versus New World. Horses and cavalry swords versus Germans in trenches with large rapid fire blam blams. In Great Britain and of course other European nations, they were foaming at the mouth to attack each other. However, culturally speaking, they were the same since Victoria had passed. Not much had changed. However, after her passing, and of course after the war, big changes, huge changes. So much so that it changed the world and in different ways in different countries. We need a whole list to go over that, but empires fell, America got rich, and they went back fighting shortly 20 years later. It was kind of awkward. Number eight, stiff photographs. For some strange reason, people in the Victoria era were like the grandfathers of all goth kids. Any obsession people have today with the strange and unnatural, well, you can partially thank the Victorians. A good example of their obsession with the weird and oddities is post-mortem photographs. Yikes, yes. Given that photographs were a new and amazing technology, and for the time, yeah, they were. And that people had some less than living relatives lying about, well, it only made sense to capture their memory forever by having their picture taken. Dressed up, prepared, and positioned in many different ways just to bring the mantle by the fireplace together as what would a home be without the post-mortem photographs of your old Aunt Burge? Am I right or am I right? It's weird, I don't know. Number seven, you'll learn the horrors of Victorian identity fraud. So, before the days of DNA testing, there was a very special kind of fraud on the market, inheritance claims. You could turn up in person after someone died and just claim to be a lost family member or spouse or bastard child in order to inherit wealth that was not yours. When her son, Roger Typeborn, was lost at sea, the wealthy lady Typeborn put adverts in the paper around the world searching for him. Arthur Orton, a butcher's son, wrote from Australia claiming to be him and asked for her to send him money to help sustain him since his shipwreck. She did so obligingly, but also pleaded with him to come home. He decided to give it a go, and when he arrived, the old woman welcomed him back as her lost son, even though Orton didn't have Sir Roger's posh accent, face, clothes. He was about 100 pounds heavier as well. When he began to claim the family estates, other relatives who couldn't be punked took legal action. The case took four years to come to court, during which time Lady Typeborn continued to believe he was her son, obviously a case of being unable to accept her real son's demise at sea. She dies just before the case is heard, meaning Orton loses his most valuable witness, but nevertheless, he memorized an enormous amount of facts about Sir Roger's life and managed to convince a hundred people to vouch for his identity. The case lasted 1,025 days, and in 1874 he was finally convicted and sentenced to 14 years of hard labor. During his prison times, he insisted on being addressed as the Lord Tykeborn and would not respond to the name Orton. Romance, an affair, a crime, it's also novella in nature. It's number six, the Bermondsey Horror. Swiss maid Maria Manning thought she had it all, a husband, a lover, and her lover's fat stacks of cash. But as she soon realized she loved the money more than both of the men, so together with her husband Frederick, she plotted to rid herself of her lover Patrick O'Connor and keep his fortune. Having chosen between Frederick and Patrick for marriage in the first place, Frederick was weirdly okay with knowing his wife was sleeping with Patrick and he frequently their home for dinners. And it's at one of these dinners in August 1849, one or both of the Mannings shoot at Connor, which doesn't kill him, so a crowbar gets involved in the mix. Once that mess is over, they buried him under the kitchen flagstones. Maria conned her way into Patrick's home and looted it like a mad woman, and then when Frederick tried to lay claim to his half, she double-crossed him because she never liked him anyways and ran away to Scotland. When O'Connor's body is inevitably found, the couple are arrested, and during the Old Bailey trial, the counsel for both the husband and wife blame each other. Miss Manning is accused of greed, and Mr. Manning is accused of acting out of jealousy. They're both given hemp neckties in November of 1849 in a crowd that included the novelist Charles Dickens. Getting psychological for number five is what the Victorians called crisis apparition. Spiritualism, which had just begun in the middle century in New York, believed that the dead residing in their own plane have both the ability and the inclination to communicate with the living. The story I'm about to share is considered a symptom of telepathy with the spirit, but other symptoms of spirit relations, such as hypnotism or taking the role of a conduit, were considered common as well. Overall, it was dubbed crisis apparition. This is a classic case of crisis apparition from a book called Pith by Londoner Newton Crossland. In October of 1857, around 1 o'clock in the day, I was going from my office to
to sign an export bond at the custom house, a distance of a quarter mile. I was in my usual satisfactory state of health. My mind was occupied with merely commonplace ideas. The traffic in the streets was ordinary, monotonous activity, and nothing was apparently there to wake in me the slightest trepidation. When I was just crossing the Great Tower Street, I was seized with an unaccounted panic. I conceived a dread that I might be attacked by a tiger, and the idea of this horrible fate haunted me so that I absolutely began running to in hot haste, and I did not stop until I found myself safe inside the walls. Newton goes on to chastise himself and think he's a fool, he can't shake the extreme levels of adrenaline and anxiety, especially given he's freaking out over a tiger attack in London. None of it makes sense. But the next morning, he's horrified to see in the newspaper. To my utter astonishment, I read that at precisely the same time I felt the crazy fear a tiger had escaped its cage and while it was being conveyed from the London docks. Seriously injured too, and about a mile as a crow flies from the spot where I was passing. You can actually find the passage in the Times newspaper published October 27, 1857 that confirms that tiger story. Pretty creepy cool, right? Either it was too easy to get away with killing or just not easy enough, welcome to number four, the Maybrick mystery. 19 year old banker's daughter Florence Chandler married 42 year old James Maybrick, an English cotton dealer. A hypochondriac serial cheater, he was also addicted to arsenic and strike recreationally, as many Victorians were. Since he was out betting the town, Florence went and found herself a boy toy too, and James was outraged. So he threatened a divorce her, which would have ruined both their reputation, so he decided to just rewrite his will and bequeath her less money. Just around the time that his addiction begins to start killing him. While on his deathbed, Florence wrote to her lover seeking potential marriage in the future once he passes. A servant passed said letter off to James's brother, who then decided from that Florence had killed him. The arsenic found all over his home is used to point fingers at her, since his family refuses to believe that James has been an addict. Meanwhile, autopsies show there wasn't enough in his system to kill him, and also that he was 100% a definitive regular user. Confirmed also by his pharmacist who says James sometimes picked it up five times a day. Did that stop them from charging Florence? No! Florence was not permitted to give testimony and was only allowed to read prepared statements at her trial. The prosecution counsel claimed if Florence was depraved enough to have an extramarital affair, then her moral compass was broken and therefore there could be no other explanation for her husband's death, except for the slew of medical professionals insisting on Florence's behalf her husband died from addiction. Despite enough evidence that in modern times the case wouldn't have even gone to court, Florence was found guilty and sentenced to death. It's later commuted to incarceration for 15 years, however, but there's no court of appeals and doubt is casted on the presiding court judge Sir James Fitzjames Stephen by an expert who asked if he had truly recovered from the seizure he had suffered years before because he had not seen such incompetence and inaccuracy by a judge before the Maybrook trial. This is actually a great segue into number three as it's about the asylum conspiracy. So Florence could literally throw the entire city pharmaceutical and coroner team at a courtroom with 100% verifiable evidence she didn't kill her husband and still receive the death penalty. Obviously it goes without saying it's due to her being a woman in that era and her story goes to show how little a voice they had. So a fun thing that started happening because people are cruel and horrible in every way was conspiracies to stick unwanted sisters, mothers, daughters, and wives in asylums by lying. Since diagnostic systems for mental illnesses were in early development and there was no consensus over what or what not was evidence of lunacy, really any doctor could have the authority to stick you in one of those if they felt your symptoms merited it, or if they were paid a handsome sum. Edith Lanchester was a young feminist who decided to live with her lover without getting married. Her family decided they'd rather she didn't, and the answer was in 1895 tapping her and throwing her into an asylum endorsed by Dr. Burroughs, who declared that Miss Lanchester's decision equated to a threat of committing social life taking and therefore evidence of irrationality. Lucky for her, the lunacy commissioners came in to inspect the asylum two days later and they freed her. Louisa Bailey was working at Bournemouth store in 1896 when after a party with colleagues, she's visited by a regular customer, Miss Digby, who spots an open bottle of brandy in the room and decides Bailey must be an alcoholic, convinces authorities, and forcefully admits her to an asylum for 11 months until she escapes. Can't have a 
little fun without an abode for love. This cult comes in at number two. The Victorians have a bit of a reputation as being at least slightly repressed. You know, the whole men need to save their essence thing mixed with the whole ladies hysteria being solved with some magic touch thing. So you can only imagine how people must have reacted when a crazy free love cult popped up in 1846. It was founded by Henry Prince, a one time clergyman who started recruiting followers, mostly rich, unmarried women, by convincing them to donate all their cash to him so he could build what was called the abode of love. According to the Telegraph, that abode was a group of cottages protected by a 12 foot wall with full privacy, meant to be a connection with nature and the gardens of life. The community was officially called a Gap Monet, and it was built mostly on the inheritance of five spinster sisters who the prince arranged had married some of his male followers. Prince himself moved into a 16 bedroom house, and while he insisted on chastity and abstinence from all followers, he was busy getting busy with all the female members of the community in very public ceremonies. In spite of his insistence that he was immortal, Prince died in 1889, and John Hugh Smith Piggott takes over that cult leader. He left the community's compound to declare he was the second coming of Christ, and was immediately run out of town and went back to the safety of the gated community. He lived there as a heavenly bridegroom among his soul brides until he too proved not to be as immortal as he claimed when he died in 1927. Alrighty, last and never the least, because it's number one, is the real Sweeney Todd. And it was a lady, so maybe I should be saying the, the real Miss Love. Love it. Oh, whatever. Born in 1849, Catherine spent her youth and then her teen years becoming well acquainted with jail, usually for theft and pitpocketing. In her adult years, she elevates to robbing boarding houses, and another six or more jail sentences later, she gets a real grown up job working for the wealthy Julia Martha Thomas. Initially, she seemed to have revised her train wreck ways, but then she starts choosing drinking over cleaning and gets canned. So Kate decides to introduce Miss Thomas's head and body to an axe. She then uses said axe to dismember Miss Thomas, parboiling the pieces and burning organs in the stove. While Kate's at it to make an extra buck, she leaves some of her fat to reduce into drippings because why not? She decides to take a break, goes to the pub, enjoys a drink, then returns, packs up the remains in boxes, places them inside cloth bags lined with thick brown paper, and then she visits pawnbrokers where she pledges Miss Thomas's gold bridge work for six shillings. This success deserved a drink or two. Kate goes to the pub, gets drunk. Kate, now calling herself Miss Thomas starts selling off the furniture. She asked a family she knew, the porters, if they suggested anyone, and they said a man named John Church might be interested. So Kate, Henry, and his son Robert set out to visit John Church. They made their way home by way of several pubs, and while visiting each, Kate tried to and did sell some of the jars of the best dripping, which was reduced body fat of Miss Thomas. She also used each spot to dispose of some of Miss Thomas's limbs, the last being Richmond Bridge, which punctuated with a large splash. A couple minutes later, Kate reappeared from the fog and said to Henry, well, that's over. Fisherman found that box the next day. John Church arrived at Vine Cottages that next day and bought the things he was supposed to. A neighbor calls the police and who do you know it? They show up. Kate does manage to escape and goes to Ireland, but she's retrieved by them and sent back to England where she's tried for her horrendous crime. Number 10, oral care. When it comes to overall health care, your teeth should also be in that list. And for the Victorians, typically they'd only really go to the dentist when the damage is near its breaking point. And because they didn't have any toothpaste that wasn't drenched in the multitude of poisons they thrived off on, people would brush their teeth using salt. Typically putting salt on their fingers and then rubbing across their teeth. The toothbrush as we know today was invented in 1857, however, it wasn't until the nylon on bristle toothbrushes of the 1930s came along that brushing one's teeth became more widespread. Salt is a natural disinfectant that helps with gum disease in a few ways. It removes loose debris and cleans the teeth and gums, but reduce inflammation and swelling and soothes the gums. It also gets rid of decay and plaque. Gum recessions can be caused by eating too much salt, and gums as part of the immune system may pull back to reveal a symptom of teeth making them more vulnerable and less resistant to tooth decay. So while it may look effective, it's actually temporarily removing surface stains. As for salt, the same holds true. Salt acts as a surface abrasive and can can definitely make the teeth look whiter, but it can definitely damage your tooth enamel. And unfortunately, once your teeth is damaged, it's damaged for life. And it wasn't until the 1940s that the concept of brushing one's teeth would be considered a routine event. Number nine, bad bathrooms. The bathroom as we know it is a Victorian invention, but at first it could be a dangerous place. Besides horrible cases of scalding in the bathtub, there was even reports that there were incidents of lavatories spontaneously exploding. The reason this might be was due to the fact that flammable gases such as methane and hydrogen sulfide emanating from human waste built up in the sewer 
sewers and then early toilets would leak back into the homes where they would theoretically be ignited by a naked flame of a candle. Wild stuff, but that did happen. And since showers were not invented yet, everyone did bathe to keep clean. Most people bathed in rather small quantities of water in their bedrooms with a basin and pitcher of cold water. Poorer families would have to boil water on the stove and then add it to the cold water to a wooden or metal tub, usually in the kitchen area where it was time for a deep scrub down. Hands, face, and armpits and crotch were essentially regions that was not necessarily to be submerged in order to maintain cleanliness. Nicer homes not only had proper porcelain bathtubs, both hot and cold taps nearby, even some had the luxury of a luxurious foot bath, but these extravagant things were more for your feet. Number eight, flammable parking sign. Although it's a great invention as it helped many advance many parts of our modern civilizations of immense proportions, it still aggressively fills out our landfills and destroys thousands of ecosystems. But still, it's a very useful material, but of course not everything about it at first was beneficial to its beholder. A British inventor named Alexander Parkes, who invented the moldable material and was considered the first celluloid of a bulk material for forming objects as we call today, Plastic. He christened it as Parkinson, but it quickly became known as its American name of celluloid. The development of celluloid was particularly spurred by the desire to reduce reliance on ivory with its shortage caused by overhunting, and the inventor Alexander was never able to see his invention reach to full fruition after his firm went bankrupt due to scale up costs. Such early plastics were highly desirable because they allowed everything from brooches to hair combs to billiard balls, previously only available in expensive ivory, to be made cheaply. It was even used to make collars and cuffs that could be easily cleaned. Unfortunately, Parkinson is also very flammable as it degrades and can self-ignite and is explosive on impact. Weird. Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality, and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time, if only it was real. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five. A rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, there is a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though, it's gonna be me. Number four, an upright worker. Upright workers, otherwise known as chimney sweeps, actually started off being children as young as the age of four. The smaller size of the little kiddos was perfect for fitting inside and climbing up and down chimneys. The little suckers would rub their elbows and knees up against the brick of the chimney so much that they would be scraped raw before callousing. Isn't that lovely? No. No, it's not. It's horrible. Some children were deliberately underfed to keep them small enough to do the job. Some of them would get permanent lung damage from the dust and smut and smoke from the chimney. Some kids even got stuck in the chimneys. Thank the Lord they eventually passed a law that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be a chimney sweep. But even then, tis not a profession many would like to have. Number three, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. 
Nah, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls. And in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. Oh, you wanna take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right, these girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two, resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god-awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number one, Night Soil Man. All right, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop. Night soil is poop. And the night soil men? Well, you see, before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soil men come in. Yes. His job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the Tichborne case. This was quite a bizarre legal case that captivated Victorian England in the 1860s and 1870s. It involved a claimant named Arthur Orton, who alleged that he was the long lost heir to the Tichborne baronetcy. Despite numerous inconsistencies in his story, Arthur managed to convince some members of the Tichborne family and a significant portion of the public that he was who he claimed to be. The case went to trial in 1873 and it became a media sensation with thousands of people lining up outside the courthouse to catch a glimpse of the proceedings. This was basically like the Victorian era's OJ trial or the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial, you know? The people wanted to know. Despite Arthur's conviction for perjury, the case continued to fascinate the public for years to come and it became a symbol of the era's fascination with sensationalism and fraud. The Tichborne case remains one of the most infamous legal cases in British history and is a cautionary tale about the dangers of believing in something without sufficient evidence. In our number 9 spot today, we have the London Beer Flood. This sounds like it would be quite a fun time, but it was anything but that and instead was a tragic event that occurred on October 17th, 1814 in the St. Giles District of London. At the Mew and Company Brewery, a massive vat containing over 135,000 gallons of beer suddenly ruptured, causing a wave of beer to flood the surrounding streets. The the torrent of beer destroyed several nearby houses, killing eight people and injuring many others. The flood was so powerful that it even knocked down the wall of a nearby pub, trapping and killing some of the patrons inside. The London beer flood was caused by a combination of factors, including poor construction of the vat and overfilling it with beer. The brewery had a history of safety concerns and many of the workers were aware of the dangers associated with working there. Despite this, the brewery continued to operate and tragedy struck. The incident became the subject of much media attention at the time and it continues to be remembered today as a tragic and bizarre event in London's history. The victims of the flood were commemorated with a plaque on the site of the former brewery and the incident has been the subject of numerous articles, books, and even a stage play. Not sure the logistics of that one though. In our number eight spot today, we have the Victorian bicycle craze. This is a name to refer to a period of intense enthusiasm for bicycles that swept across Europe and North America in the late 19th century. The introduction of the safety bicycle with its chain driven mechanism and rubber tires made cycling a much more accessible activity for the general public. It became a popular mode of transportation and leisure activity, particularly among the middle and upper classes. The craze also had a significant impact on fashion, with women's clothing becoming more practical and comfortable to allow for cycling. It's funny to think of now because like 
it's just a bike. But at the time, it was so much more than that. It's like how smartphones completely changed our lives in more ways than we probably even know. That's basically what the bike was like in the Victorian era. The bicycle craze had a profound impact on society and culture at the time. It led to the development of new industries, such as cycling clubs, and it also paved the way for the modern transportation industry. The bicycle became a symbol of freedom and empowerment, particularly for women who were able to travel further and faster than ever before. The Victorian bicycle craze remains an important cultural and historical phenomenon that changed the way people lived, worked, and played. Number seven, brac boracic acid in milk. No one should cry over spilt milk unless it's been treated by boracic acid, and in that case you'd be 100% allowed to cry and your experiences are valid. In the 1800s, boracic acid was believed to purify milk, removing the sour taste and smell from milk that had gone off. In a casual remark in her widely popular 1861 book, Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, mentioned one should use boracic acid in their milk. She told consumers that this was quite harmless in an addition, but she was wrong. Boracic acid purifying milk was responsible for getting a lot of people sick. Small amounts of boracic acid could cause nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, but worse, it was what boracic acid concealed that was particularly dangerous, and before pasteurization, milk was often contained a huge amount of bovine TB, or, you know, beef TB, tuberculosis, which would flourish in the bacteria-friendly environment created by the substance. Bovine TB damages the internal organs and the bones of the spine, leading to a severe spinal deformities. It is estimated that up to half a million young people had died from bovine TB from the milk in the Victorian period, which is why you should check your sources and not get everything from one source, like your mom telling you this random article that she found on Facebook. Number six, carbolic acid poisoning. Victorians linked cleanliness to godliness and respectability. The idea that it was next to godliness was very deeply ingrained. The new science of microbes only in testified the Victorian preoccupation with tackling germs which they now knew could lurk out of sight. Chemical cleaning products to eradicate dirt and diseases were heavily advertised and highly effective, but their active toxic ingredients like carbolic acid were contained in bottles and packages that were indistinguishable from other household products. Boxes of caustic soda and baking powder could be easily mistaken. In September 1888, it was reported in an article that 13 people had been poisoned by carbolic acid in one incident, and five died. And only in 1902 did the Pharmacy Act made it illegal for bottles of dangerous chemicals to be similar in the shape of ordinary liquids. So it took a couple of years, but still, at least now we wouldn't have issues identifying bottles from the other. But as cleaning products go, arsenic and citrus 9 were commonly used in Victorian cleaning products, which if some don't know, the immediate symptoms of acute arsenic poisoning includes vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Those are followed by numbness, tingling of the extremities, and muscle cramping and death. But the Victorian era was also about fitting into their corsets, and a few illnesses wasn't necessarily seen as a bad thing. But either way, the era in itself wasn't unfamiliar with tragedies, as death lurked at every corner from either poisoning or TV. Number five, washing the hair. I have really long hair, and it does take a minute to maintain it, but thanks to modern technology and our hair products in the rooms, I don't have to worry that much about my hair. But in the Victorian era, women's hair were considered the crowning glory, and the longer, the healthier it is, the better. It would only be let down when she was alone with her husband, and so stayed in pins for the rest of the time. To keep it healthy, women didn't have to wash their hair nearly as often as we do today, taking this particular habit only a weekly or monthly schedule. According to research on the hair care part of the period that this was in, hygiene and beauty towards the end of the Victorian era suggested that people with oily hair should only wash their hair every two weeks or so, and those with normal hair should wash it once a month. And since sources recommended washing the hair and scalp one or two times a week, the reason being is because soap would quickly dry off the scalp, leaving it very itchy and dry. And of course, this was an era where they didn't know much about chemicals and its horrible effects on the human body, and sometimes even used pure ammonia to clean the hair, which as you know, ammonia is a product used for cleaning hard surfaces like your stove or your sink. So it cleaning your scalp would be very bad. Still, I'm wondering how did they use ammonia if their hair didn't fall out. Probably either way, shampoo is still something that we use now as it was invented in 1927 as a liquid soap. Number four, bread alternated with alum. When basic staples like bread started to be produced cheaply and in large quantities for the new city dwellers, Victorian manufacturers seized the opportunity to maximize profit by switching ingredients for cheaper substitutes that would add weight and bulk. Bread was altered, adulterated with plaster of Paris, bean flour, chalk, and alum. Alum is an aluminum-based compound today used in detergent, but then it was used as bread back in the day because it was whiter and heavier. Not only did such adulteration lead to such problems as malnutrition, but alum produced bowel problems and constipation or chronic diarrhea, which was also often fatal for people. Number three, beauty. Those unlucky to be born with freckles were advised to rinse their faces with lemon juice, or in more stubborn cases, rub the crap out of their skin with carbolic acid, or sit in the sun until the freckles burnt off. And if premature wrinkles resulted from these harsh so-called cures, young women might be having the habits of their older relatives and drape their faces with 
thin slices of raw beef before bed. Sleeping with any animal fat on the skin, like fat, veal, lard, all that stuff, was thought to restore youthful suppleness and beauty. Looking fit and healthy is a very common shared narrative that has been defined and redefined multiple times throughout history. And when it came to the Victorian era, weight loss drugs was often permitted, and if anything, encouraged for both genders, but mainly ladies to maintain their figures in and out of corsets. Overweight women were instructed to drink their water with lemon, and if that didn't do the trick during the weight loss drugs, they would also uh, use ingredients like arsenic and cocaine, believe it or not, tapeworm larvae. The skinny women didn't have an easy time either, as they were also told to lie still as often as possible in dim light to avoid all anxiety endeavoring to feel indifferent to every sensation as one book had recommended. Weird. Number two, asbestos. Asbestos was the new wonder material of the Victorian era and was used in all manner of household objects as insulation for electrical appliances like toasters and hair dryers mixed into plaster and applied to walls and even some toys, which is actually still a problem that we're facing today. By the end of the 18th century, scientists have discovered many uses for asbestos, such as filters and for fire resistance. This paved the way for asbestos becoming a popular industrial material by the mid 1800s. However, when commercial products of asbestos insulation began in 1879, the first case of an asbestos related disease described as curious bodies in the lungs were detected in 1899. The first cases of asbestos and lung cancer are attributed to asbestos exposure, which was diagnosed in the United States. Symptoms can vary into severity, but in common okay note, some types of asbestos are cleared naturally by the lungs or broken down already in the lungs. But long-term effects of the exposure doesn't show up until 10 to 40 years later. There is no cure for asbestos once it has developed, and because it's not possible to reverse the damage to the lungs, meaning those who are exposed to asbestos for a long time had the consequences the longer they were exposed to it. Number one, arsenic. We all have our own favorite colors. Mine depends on my mood, but it's usually red or black. For the Victorians, it was notably obsessed with the color green, even to the point that shades of green was driving them nuts. For some reason, they placed in a nice shade of green wallpaper, and everyone at home was just getting sick, from the young to the old. When a doctor in the 1860s noticed a spike of hospital visits, all the patients seemed to share the same idea of green wallpaper wrapped around their walls. The culprit was found in the dye used in the production of the paper, a vibrant green pigment containing a highly toxic metalloid arsenic. The killer, as it so often turns out, was inside the house, plastered on an every wall and beautifully decorated sheets. Wallpaper was killing people. While arsenic was known most as a rat poison in homes, the substance found its way in every other aspect of the daily life of the Victorian person. It could be found in household items such as food coloring, dresses and baby strollers, to makeup. When mixed with paint, arsenic created an alluring, pearlescent effect, most typically a brilliant shade of green, and so it became fashionable to wear laurels and flowers painted with the dye. Like poisonous lead before it, radioactive of radium after, dousing yourself in arsenic was a deadly fashion trend of the day. Chemists and governments were very well aware of the dangers of the element, but demanded that such miners pulled it out of the earth in volume nonetheless. In summary, it was a renowned designer and social activist named William Morris noted the poisonous substance and the new health regulations associated with it and decided to change it to non-toxic wallpaper. Number 10. Train Engine Cleaner Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect! You can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Now Number 9. Linker Boy or Linker Men Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you. Oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Oi! Where are you going, mate? You forgot to like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not take a little peek over at our Facebook, where you'll find behind the scenes content. Get on with it! All right, all right, bloody hell, bloody hell. Number eight, knock her up. No, not like that. God. Look, 
I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. In our number seven spot today, we have the Crimean War. The Crimean War was a conflict fought between 1853 and 1856, primarily involving Russia and an alliance of France, Britain, the Ottoman Empire, and Sardinia. The war was fought over various territorial and religious disputes, particularly particularly regarding the rights of Christians in the Ottoman Empire. The war was marked by high casualties, particularly from disease and poor medical care, and it is often seen as a turning point in military medicine. The war also featured some of the first extensive use of modern technologies such as telegraphs and railways, which greatly impacted warfare in the future. The war ended in a victory for the Allied forces, and it resulted in a significant shakeup of the balance of power in Europe. It also demonstrated the need for improved communication organization and medical care in military conflicts, and it had significant long-term impacts on military and political strategies in Europe and beyond. In our number six spot today, we have the East End Outbreak. The East End Outbreak was an outbreak of cholera in 1866 and was a major epidemic that struck the densely populated area of East London, causing widespread illness and death. Cholera is a highly contagious disease that spreads through contaminated water, and in the Victorian era, London London's water supply was notoriously unsanitary. The outbreak was particularly devastating in the East End, where poverty and overcrowding made residents more vulnerable to disease. The outbreak led to significant changes in public health policy and infrastructure, as well as increased public awareness of the importance of sanitation and hygiene. The physician John Snow, which you know feels like a weird name to say when I'm not talking about Game of Thrones, but the physician John Snow played a key role in identifying the source of the outbreak tracing it to a contaminated water pump on Broad Street. His work really paved the way for the development of modern epidemiology and disease prevention. The East End cholera outbreak remains a significant event in the history of public health and the struggle for social justice. It brought attention to the urgent need for clean water and adequate sanitation, and it helped to spur reforms that improved the health and well-being of people in urban areas. In our number five spot today, we have the London Burkers. This is the name used to refer to a notorious of body snatchers who operated in London in the early 19th century. They were involved in the illegal trade of selling corpses to medical schools for dissection and study, and they would often resort to killings to obtain the bodies. The most infamous member of the gang was William Burke, who, along with his partner William Hare, committed a series of killings in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1828. They sold the corpses to the anatomist Robert Knox, who was unaware of their methods. Two of the group's members, John Bishop and Thomas Williams, were convicted of killings and sentenced to death. The London Burger scandal highlighted the demand for fresh corpses for medical research and contributed to the passage of the Anatomy Act of 1832, which allowed for the legal procurement of corpses for medical purposes. Emphasis on the legal part of that, though. It's important. In our number four spot today, we have the Great Stink of London. The Great Stink of London was an environmental disaster that occurred in the summer of 1858. It was caused by the city's inadequate sewage system, which allowed raw sewage and waste to be dumped directly into the River Thames. The hot weather only exacerbated the problem, which is disgusting, and it caused the sewage to ferment and emit a foul odor that permeated the city. The smell was so overwhelming that it caused widespread illness and forced many people to flee the city. Parliament was forced to act, and a major engineering project was launched to build a modern sewage system for London. This project was led by engineer Joseph Bazalget, who designed a system of sewers and pumping stations that would carry sewage out of the city and into the Thames estuary. The construction of the new sewage system was a massive undertaking, involving the excavation of miles of tunnels and the construction of large pumping stations. It took several years to complete, but once it was finished, 
unleashed, it greatly improved the health and hygiene of the city. The Great Stink was a turning point in the history of public health, and it helped to spur major improvements in sanitation and public health infrastructure across the developed world. Today, the legacy of the Great Stink lives on in the modern sewer systems and wastewater treatment facilities that are really essential for maintaining public health and environmental quality. In our number three spot today, we have Typhoid Mary. The Typhoid Mary case is a famous incident in the history of public health in the United States. Mary Mallon, also known as Typhoid Mary, was an asymptomatic carrier of the bacteria that causes typhoid fever, a potentially fatal disease. Despite being unaware of her condition, Mary inadvertently infected numerous people during her work as a cook in New York City in the early 1900s. After a number of typhoid outbreaks were traced back to Mary's cooking, she was tracked down and forcibly quarantined for several years. The case generated significant controversy at the time, with some arguing that Mary's civil rights had been violated and others maintaining that public safety justified her isolation. The Typhoid Mary case remains significant for its implications for public health policy and for the balance between individual rights and public safety. In our number two spot today, we have the Birmingham riots. These riots took place in 1839 and they were a series of violent clashes that occurred in the city of Birmingham, England. The riots were sparked by tensions between two groups. The Chartists, who were calling for political reform and greater democratic representation, and the authorities who opposed the movement. On July 4th, 1839, a group of Chartists held a rally in Birmingham's Bull Ring where they were met with opposition from local government agencies. The situation quickly escalated into violence with protesters and authorities engaging in brutal clashes that lasted for several days. The Birmingham riots of 1839 were significant for their role in the history of the Chartist movement, and it is said that the events of 1839 demonstrated the lengths to which authorities were willing to go to suppress the movement. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Brown Dog Affair. This was a controversy that arose in the early 20th century in London over the use of animals in medical research. In 1903, a statue of a brown dog was erected in Battersea, which had been used in vivisection experiments by a scientist named William Bayless. If you're unfamiliar, vivisection is defined as, quote, the practice of performing operations on live animals for the purpose of experimentation or scientific research. While I am all for the advancement of science, I do believe in ethical studies, and this clearly was not that. The statue was intended as a memorial to the countless animals that had been used in medical research, but it was met with outrage from some people. Anti-vivisection groups saw it as a symbol of animal cruelty, while some medical researchers saw it as an attack on their work. In 1907, a group of medical students attacked the statue during a protest, sparking a violent confrontation with anti-vivisection activists. The statue was eventually removed by authorities, but the controversy continued to rage on for many years. The Brown Dog Affair highlighted the deep divisions in society over the use of animals in medical research and contributed to the development of new laws and regulations aimed at protecting animal welfare. Yeah.